looking at us over, over the web. <clears throat> this is pastor's class, the jars of clay. And today we're talking about Stephen and, and how his example for us is, is, is relative to us today. <clears throat> now, we were thinking about Stephen. Uh, I, I want you to think about the day of Pentecost. <clears throat> the very, very first day after Pentecost, there was 3,000 people in the church. And, you know, I said things can change quickly. So you had 120 in the upper room <clears throat> that were seeking the Lord. <clears throat> Excuse me. And as and soon as the Holy Spirit fell on that 120, Peter goes out and preaches this sermon. First sermon after that. And 3,000 people got saved. That's kind of like a Billy Graham crusade almost. Uh, I, can't, I can't put wrap my mind around that hardly. Uh, and then that's in Acts chapter 2 if you look at verse 41. And then there's another 5,000 over in Acts chapter 4. There's another 5,000. That's 8,000 people that's in the church just right off the bat. Probably in a few weeks or months, a couple of months or something like that. A, a church with 8,000 people to look after. Uh, can you imagine that, Shelley? Looking after that man. <laughs> yeah, keeping up with all the paperwork and everything with that. Uh, and, and everything's running fine there for, for a little while, but things begin to change. And it started out slowly because if you read the Gospels, you'll see, I mean, the, in the book of Acts, starting in the book of Acts, you, you'll see where everything's going along and, the, and the, they're preaching and, and the Lord's adding to the church. Uh, but things start to change a little bit. And, and there's just a few arrests start happening. Uh, they're, the apostles, they, they're beaten and told not to preach in Jesus' name. But the church, if you look at church history, as it, as it goes on, we see Peter and John, I think these other disciples, sometimes they've been a, just miraculously delivered to go preach the gospel more. Remember when Peter was in prison and, and an angel had to, had to wake up, had to punch him and wake up, Peter, you're, you're getting out of here. And so Peter had still, still has some more work to do and the gospel is being preached here. And... Uh, I, Here's the point I want to make, I guess, talking about Stephen. Uh, here's another preacher. Stephen was a, a preacher. And, and preach, Stephen preached and wound up being martyred for the same, same thing, preaching the gospel. Now, the, here you've got two, two things. Peter, he's been delivered to preach. And over here's Stephen. He's preaching and he gets killed for it. Uh, and, and we're going to look at that here in just a minute. Now, that's how quickly things changed in Jerusalem here. And, and like I said, things could change real quickly here in, in our country. But remember uh, when Peter said, don't think it's strange when these fiery trials come. He said, that, you know, don't think it's strange or unexpected. Don't even think it's, it's unjust when, when these fiery trials come against you. Uh, do you know what context? We, re, we say that verse. I've, I've quoted that verse, and I know you've heard it quoted and, and we, it's something that sticks in our mind. You know, we don't think it's strange you know, when these trials that happen to us. But do you know what the context was that, that he said that in? First Peter chapter 4. Here's what the context of what Peter said there. He said, but the end of all things is at hand. Be you therefore sober and watch in the prayer. Then four verses later, that's when he says, don't think it's strange when these fiery trials come. When? He, Peter said, when the end of all things is at hand. So we're here in these last days, and we're, we're not going to think it's strange whenever all of a sudden some things start caving in on us a little bit. The, the, the ease, the ease and, and the, uh, the, uh, the way that we're able to, to worship the Lord, the way, the way we're able to gather together, uh, is, it could change. And the reason I'm telling you, I'm not a doomsday person. I, I've got a good outlook on life. But the reality is... If you see a storm coming, you can see the clouds, right? And spiritually, you can see the clouds coming over the church that's headed our direction. And we don't need to stick our heads in the sand and just be caught all just totally by surprise. Paul talked about it. He said, we're not unaware of Satan's devices. He said, we know, you know the things that, that the devil's got planned for us. We read the back of the book. So we know what's going to happen here. And that, that's, that's why I said uh, you know, we need to be on guard to, to, to be aware of what's happening around us. Uh, we can't stick our heads in the sand and pretend it's not happening. So if, if Peter's looking down through time and, and he warned us about what's, going come, what's coming, what's going to happen to Christians, what do we do with this information? 
you know, what do we do with these instructions? Uh, right now, we're living in the most, the most blessed nation in, in the history of the world. Uh, if, you, if you go back through world history, pick up any, if, well, you can't do it now, but a few years ago, you could pick up a world history book and, and, and look at what's happened over the, the course of time, all the way from the Egyptian society all the way up to now. There's never been a nation like this. Uh, and, and we're blessed to be in it. Um, most people, though, the reality is uh, saved and unsaved. doesn't matter. Most people think this is going to continue on forever, you know, I mean, for ages to come. Uh, when we read the back of the book, we know that, that uh, things has a different thing. I want to read something to you. I've run across this thing here, and uh, I want you to... Give me, give me a little feedback for a, for a second after I read this to you. I'm going to read it. This, this is a, a democracy. Democracy is always temporary in nature. It simply cannot exist as a permanent form of government. A democracy will continue to exist up until the time that the voters discover the, that they can vote themselves generous gifts from the public treasury. From that moment on, the, the majority always votes for the candidates who promise the most benefits from the public treasury, with the result that every democracy will finally collapse due to loose physical policy, which is always followed by a dictatorship. The average age of the world's greatest civilizations from the beginning of history has been about 200 years. Uh, during those 200 years, these nations always progress through the following sequence. Now listen to this. From bondage to spiritual faith, from spiritual faith to great courage, <clears throat> from courage to liberty, from liberty to abundance, from abundance to selfishness, from selfishness to complacency, and from complacency to apathy, and from apathy to dependence, and from dependence back into bondage. When do you think that was written? <clears throat> Somebody give me, a, just give me a guess. I, I know, I'm not going, listen, you're not graded on this. But. That, it, you're, you're close. It, it was written by a man, uh, Thomas Tytler, Ty, Ty, in 1787. Uh, do you think he had some foresight about what, what happens, the course of, of nature uh, with uh, the way we're living? Like I said, we take for granted what we've got in this country. Uh, we're living in a society that, this, like a pastor says, the most narcissistic society you've ever seen in your life. People walk around like this all the time. I'm going to eat a steak, you know. Uh, I mean, now look at what, here's what I'm eating. I mean, is that, does that make sense to you? We've never been in the day like we are in the day. Go ahead, Brian. <clears throat> You've never, never really known it about how people live. People live <clears throat> you see how they live. Mm -hmm. You know about this, the flesh. Oh, absolutely. Mm -hmm. so yeah, Chris and I, we're running around, and, and the, 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 the young ladies, the prostituted, mm -hmm. very young, and, and the men are all over the place. Mm -hmm. And they don't really understand until you see this for your own self. Right, absolutely. Chris and I were on a, took a cruise a good number of years ago, and, and we, one of the stops they took was in Cartagena. That's on the northern tip of, of South America. And uh, we got off and went to this little monastery up on top of a mountain. But on the way, they're, they're, like you were talking about, there were houses that were no, about half the size of this platform. And they, and they had a fence around the house and barbed wire around the top to keep their stuff. That's, that's how they live. Uh, we, we don't understand that in this country. Uh, the poor folks in this country got it better than, than most of the rest of the world and some of these other places. But let's look at Stephen for just a minute here. Uh, who's this man, Stephen? Well, we know that he was a deacon. Now, where did deacons come from? But this, this is a little bit of just history for us for a second. In Acts chapter 6, if you want to follow along, and, and I encourage you to look at your Bible sometimes. If you see things, you read things, and we just keep glazing right over it, keep going. But there's all these nuggets, all these things in here that we need to pull out. In, in Acts chapter 6, verse, uh, first three verses here, it says, In those days when the number of disciples is multiplied. Notice, you remember what the pastor said, uh, was it last week or week before last, about God's into multiplication and, and addition? 
Well, we just read verses in, that talked about that God added to the church daily. You know how the Lord did this. Look at this verse here. He said, uh, and, and the number of disciples was multiplied. What's the least number you can multiply? Not besides one. One times one is one. Two, right? So if there's 8,000 people in the church to start with, the least denominator that you can multiply is what? Two. So how many people is that? 16? At least 16,000 people. At least 15, 16,000 people in a, in a new church here. So that's, that's the setting that, that this scripture here is, is, is in. He said, And there arose a murmuring among the Grecians against the Hebrews because their widows were neglected in the daily ministration. Then the twelve, the, the apostles here, called uh, the multitude of disciples unto him and said, It is not reason that we should lead the work of God and serve tables. Wherefore, brethren, look ye out among you seven men of honest report, full of the Holy Ghost and wisdom, who ye may appoint over this business. Now, like I said, some, some time, a little bit of time, the Bible doesn't tell us how long this is, but has, has elapsed here between the, the, the initial uh, church, but it's, it's grown to, to tremendously here. And, and there was a need. You know, the disciples, I mean, the apostles, they said, look, we've got to, we've have to, we've got to study and get ready to, to preach our sermon. That's in our modern day language. And, and they didn't have time to, to, to do all the ministration of, of looking after, what was some of the gospel? Look after the widows and fathers, right? right? So that was part of what the church was doing here. So Stephen here. Uh, these, he was one, the Bible tells us that he was the chief of uh, the deacons here. So what do we know about this man, Stephen, here? If you look at verse, uh, in chapter 6, verse 8, uh, Stephen, he didn't only help with the food distribution here, but, but if you look at that verse, uh, he found time to help the apostles in their, their public ministry here. It says here that Stephen was full of the Holy Ghost, and he was full of faith and power, did great wonders and miracles among the, the people. Now, if you, when you read that verse, it's kind of interesting that Luke didn't record or didn't spend any time talking about the miracles of Stephen. But what's he talking about? He, he focuses, he centers on what Stephen had to say under the anointing of the Holy Spirit. Just, and, and we're going to see that just a little later. So what am I talking about? During the day uh, on the job or out in public or even at home, what are we talking about? You know, what's, what's the thing that, that motivates our, our thought patterns? What, what is it? Uh, I know you have to work on the job, and I know you have to focus. You have to keep you know, your mind on what you're doing. Driving, you want to make sure you know where you're going. Brother Mike. I just went to coal mines there. I carried a New Testament in my pocket, and the chance I got, I was reading it. You know, <clears throat> and I was Mm-hmm. And uh, I think the Lord expects us to spend time with Him, no matter if we're on the job or we're in Walmart. We can still talk to the Lord. It don't matter. Oh yeah. We're and that's the that's the importance of knowing what the Bible says about what you're going to face tomorrow. Some of you are going back to work in the morning. You know, do you know what you're going to be faced with? No, not really. Uh, so. I mean, how are you going to do it? Everything we do should be filtered through the, the scriptures, through, through the Bible, through the scriptures, what we, what we know, what in our heart, and, and know what the scripture says. How do you react? When somebody jumps on your face, the very first thing at work, your boss man jumps down your throat, the first thing at work, how do you react to that? I mean, that, it should be through, through the scriptures, through what the Lord has to say to us here. Um, and, and I'm not saying that, that you go around... Uh, Every minute of the day spouting Bible verses, not talking about that. But in the, Paul said to pray always with all prayer and supplication. Now, Paul wasn't talking about walking around. You've seen these, uh, these monks and people that walk around, you know, with doing the prayers and things all day long. He wasn't talking about that. But in the, in the back of your mind, you're, in your subconscious, you, you, you can be praying for a loved one. I know uh, I've, I've prayed for family members that... It, you know, even on the job, I'm doing my job and I'm, I'm you know, keeping everything in like it's supposed to be. But in the back of my mind, I, that's what's there. And, and for, every, for everybody, it's not that. There might, somebody might be fishing that's in the back of your mind it, or you know, whatever it is. It might be you know, something you know, uh, for the shopping, whatever it is, something else. But what, what I'm saying is the scriptures, you know, the, the, what we know about the Lord, what his, our relationship with him means. 
That's what ought to be in the back of our minds all the time. Um, then verse, look at verse 9. Verse 9 and 10 here. It says, uh, Then there arose certain of the synagogue, which call, uh, is called the synagogue of the Libertines, or the, and the Cyrenians, the Alexandrians, and, and of them of Cilicia and of Asia, disputing with Stephen. And they were not able to resist the wisdom and the spirit by which he spoke. Remember I just said that, that in the, what, the very verses before this, that Stephen was going about doing miracles and stuff. And here's Luke. He's not, he's not focused on the miracles. He's talking about, he said, they're not able to resist the wisdom which, we, which uh, Stephen was speaking here. Um, and if you look at that, that verse 9 there, you, you see all these people that he's preaching to. These libertines, they were descendants of Jews that had been carried captive uh, at least 100 years before Christ. And, and later on they were freed, so that's why they were Greek speaking. That's why the scriptures here says that these, these were Grecians. They, were, they spoke Greek. And, and notice what it says there. They were disputing with Stephen. And this kind of tells us about the message of the gospel. It, it's the method changed. Pastor says what? But the message doesn't. So here's, here's Stephen. He, he's preaching the same message that the, the apostles were preaching. And, and they're disputing with him. So uh, the world doesn't want to hear about Jesus. They don't want to hear the truth. They don't want to hear the truth. You're right. Uh, I, I saw something a while back, and, and it kind of, I knew it was true, but it just didn't hit me until I heard it. But most every European country over there has, a, has adopted or they've embraced atheistic views in their culture. Uh, in, in Germany, I, I saw on the news, there's a synagogue, a Jewish synagogue has been built. And it, it'll seat, maybe they said, maybe 40 people. And that was big news. I mean, they don't. Uh, Germany has, they don't acknowledge God in anything. Uh, so, I mean, it was big news for this synagogue to be built. And I, and I thought, well, here in America, we, we could build a church on every corner. It's, it's no big news. Uh, the Jehovah Witness can put a church up in a week. I've seen that happen. I mean, they, they got all their stuff together. I mean, it, it, it's no big deal, right? It doesn't make the news. So in Europe, uh, they've, they've embraced this atheistic view about Christ. Uh, we know about the Middle East. We know where they stand. You know, when the, uh, the, the main religion over there is, is Muslim, Islam. Uh, China, we already mentioned China. It's illegal to be a Christian over there. In, in Russia, you can, you can go to a state-run church in Russia. And uh, in, in China, I, I saw something here a couple of, I guess, last week or so. Uh, if I was a minister in China, you'd have to submit your sermon to the authorities and make sure that, that it was, uh, you know, uh, it was applied to the, the communistic view. I mean, that's that's the way they do things. So, uh, yeah, go ahead. I mean, that's not far from here because in Houston, Texas, the mayor, who was gay at that time, probably two years ago, tried to have all the pastors <clears throat> put their sermon into him to make sure that there was no hate speech against the LGBTQ. Mm -hmm. community at that time. Yep. Uh, of course, he got overruled when I got sent to court. Right. I mean, yeah, that's not hard. I mean, look at the restrictions they're putting on the church in Canada. Yeah. That's our neighbor to the north of us. Yeah. And, and we think they're free. You know. We tend to adopt everything that comes down the pipe. I mean, that's, that's the main. Think about this. United States, what do we do? We kick God out of school systems, right? Uh, no Bible study, no prayer in school. Uh, he, he's been kicked out of all of our government buildings, our institutions. Uh, you think about it. most high school graduations have have and, and many, many, many of the sporting events. Uh, they've banned uh, prayer, anything that prayer that mentions Jesus. You know, the only thing I saw. And I'm, I'm going off chasing a rabbit here. Uh, uh, NASCAR, they have heard them pray. They have chaplains, and they'll actually pray on national television and use Jesus' name. And I thought, how in the world, how long will that last? You know, they, surely it won't last long. But, but we, you can't mention the name of Jesus in public anymore without being ridiculed or, or labeled some kind of hate speech. So, I mean, we can plainly see this world doesn't want anything to do with Jesus. Like Brother Mike said, they don't want to hear the truth. 
So uh, here's what verse 10 said. The bottom of, at the end of verse 10 there says, they couldn't resist the wisdom and the spirit by which he preached. Talking about Stephen. Whose spirit, whose wisdom was, was Stephen preaching in? Jesus, right? The Holy Spirit, that's, that's what he was preaching in. And, and, and again, it seems like we face that question, it always comes up in the pastor's sermons and, and when he's teaching. Without the infilling of the Holy Spirit, do you think, do you think Stephen would have been as convincing in, in, his, in his message, in his preaching, if the Holy Spirit hadn't been? What did Paul say? He said, I didn't come with excellency of speech. He said, I didn't come with enticing words. Uh, I didn't come using these $25 words that nobody understands. He said, I didn't do that. He said, I came in what? Somebody tell me, what did it come in? The power, power of the Holy Spirit in his life. That, that's, that's what we need, the infilling of the Holy Spirit. That's the importance of it. Uh, and, and it says, you know, these Greek Jews, uh, they couldn't refute the words of Stephen. So, so they had to result to something else. And, and again, this is, if we read the scriptures and, we, and it's just historical to us, that, you know, we, we forget about it. But if you read it and try to bring it forward into today's, to today's society, it kind of starts making sense to us. Look at verse 11. It says, Then they suborned or recruited men which said, We have heard him speak blasphemous words against Moses and against God. And they stirred up the people and the elders and the scribes came to him and, talk, and called him and brought him to the council and set up false witnesses which said, this man ceaseth not to speak blasphemous words against this holy place in the law. They couldn't find any real charges against Stephen, so they resorted to, to lies and, and deceit uh, to try to stop his success in preaching here. Uh, Stephen's words are twisted and taken out of context. Do you think the devil still uses that, con that, that tactics today? Yeah. <laughs> Did we not see it in, in uh, I hate to bring this up, the Russian hoax? <laughs> did, we, did we not see that? I mean, even when they prove it said there's nothing to this, the, the tactics that the devil uses is not new. He's been doing this. What, what he did against Stephen, it still works today. Yeah. Brother Mike, go ahead. I, I didn't catch you. Uh, I forgot what I was going to say. Oh. <laughs> anyway, uh, uh, the same, like you said, the same tactic he used against mm -hmm. Stephen. Mm -hmm. Think about this. We, we live in a day and age when, when, when lying is the norm. It's the normal thing. I mean, it's, it doesn't matter. The truth is, is relative. That's what, that's what you, you hear on these progressive people talking about. You know, there's a thing called progressive Christianity. Yeah, if anybody's ever heard of it, there is. Yeah, it's, it's just a liberal Christianity. And, uh, that's the truth. Does, it's, it's just relative to whatever you make it. That's that's what uh, their philosophy is, and, and we see this this normal about lying, especially in our in our news and the political system. We we know that we don't have to go back and talk about it again. But but it's there. I mean, we know what's happened. Uh, here's the sad part about it. if if our news media, TV, Twitter, Facebook, all these outlets, if they had some kind of important information true information to give us nobody would believe them anymore i mean we had, yeah I, you know i don't remember if i told you this or not i, I may have but I'll, I'll repeat it again years ago many years ago back uh, it's got to be at least 10 15 years ago uh nbc did this thing about i think it was gmc trucks pickup trucks and they've been a couple of wrecks where the truck had caught on fire and and so NBC, they said, okay, we're going we're gonna to document this thing. So they took some trucks. I forgot how many trucks they wrecked, and they never caught on fire. So they, what they did, they took some explosives and put it on, at the gas tank, and they wrecked it. Boom, here it goes. Ah, oh, there it is. See, here's what happens whenever these trucks wreck. Well, it was, they were exposed. Somebody, you know, somebody's, you know, whistleblower spilled the beans on them. And, and but did that change their attitude? It didn't change. That was their way of presenting the truth to the American people. Now here's another one. Now, this happened just last year. I'll, I'll let you just say, last year I was watching something in the morning news, trying to watch the weather, and uh, there was this uh, guy who was talking about pill bottles, the, the childproof pill bottles. You know the caps that you got to push and turn. 
Well, he was talking about that and had this little girl, probably four years old or so, sitting on the floor with all of these pill bottles around her. And, and they, her instructions were, you, you, you open, take the top off these pill bottles. So she picks them up and some of them just fell, just fell off. She picks them up and she just give a little turn and it, they were just falling off. And I thought, I know these things are harder than that. But this guy, the, the one that was doing it, he said, see, here's, here's the truth. You know, here's what it is. And that's why I say we're, we get so used to being lied to that, that it's, you don't even, it doesn't even bother us anymore. It's almost like the, the, we mentioned the, the gay pride stuff. What, what uh, shock value does it have now? Does it, does it shock you if you see any? No. We have seen it over and over and over and over again. So what's the devil trying to do to us, in our, and especially in America? I'm talking about this country here today. We know what's happening around the world. It is. That's, that's, that's it. Uh, so, I mean, and, and it's not just related and just uh, left to the, to the news media. Uh, it, it reaches down to the personal level. Once society has such a, a, we talk about peer pressure, and this is a general broad statement about peer pressure. Society is a peer pressure in itself. Uh, when you see what's happening around us, we've got to be like, you know, we, gotta, we don't want to be out of step. We've got we to gotta be just like everybody else. So e- even on a personal level, uh, we, people can hear what they want to hear. You, you might say something. I might say something to Brother Eddie. And, 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 and Joe hears something else. You know, he didn't hear the whole story. And, and then all of a sudden, there, there's a difference in what I said and what, what, what Joe might have said. So, I mean, does that happen? Yeah, it happens. We, we see it. Does it happen in the church? Yeah, it does. Go ahead. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah, there's no game he used to do like that. <laughs> that's it. And, and that, that's the, to me, that's the, so important for us when we communicate. We need to communicate clearly uh, to make sure people understand what we're talking about, especially when we're talking about the gospel. Uh, we use church language. People, unsaved people, a lot of times don't understand what we're talking about. Uh, before I got saved, I, you know, I didn't know what the burden of sin was. You know, I, I, until I got saved, I felt what that burden was. I understood. Then I knew. But, but we use language sometimes that, that the, the unsaved person doesn't even know what we're talking about. So we, when, that's why I said when we communicate with people, if you witness in somebody, make sure that you use language that they understand. Well, here's the thing. Here's what they said about, you know, we're talking about lying. Stephen got lied on. <clears throat> here's what it said in verse uh, 14. He said, for we, these are people that are talking to in this council here. He's in the courtroom right now, Stephen is. And they said, if we've heard him say that this Jesus of Nazareth will destroy this place and, and will change the customs which Moses delivered us. Does that sound familiar? That's what they said about Jesus, wasn't it, when they brought him to, to trial. Uh, they said the same thing about him. And, and it's the same problem with the Jews surfaces here again uh i guess the bottom line here is is that that their, their customs their traditions got in the way of them believing the truth uh do we let customs and traditions get in the way of how we what god's trying to do in our life sometimes i mean it's, it's easy to do uh god gave israel the jews here he gave them the old testament and that was pointing to Christ. Every, every pastor said it so many times. Every, everything in the Old Testament is a shadow of Christ. Things to come. Even, even the festivals. Uh, I've been looking at the festivals, uh, the feast, uh, Passover. We know what Passover was. And, and Pentecost. We know what these were. Uh, first fruits. We know what these are. These, you know, Jesus was the first fruit. Scripture says he was the first fruit of, those, uh, that, of the, the, the resurrection. So... All these things mean something. They point to, to Christ, and, and for some reason, uh, their customs and traditions 
they couldn't, it became their idol almost. They, they couldn't see the truth that was before them. And, and I thought, you know, God help us. Can that happen today? I mean, we know it can. What if our customary way of doing church becomes ritual? That we go through every Sunday. Yeah, you know, we, we know we know what we're gonna sing some songs, we're gonna take up the offering, we're gonna hear a message, we're gonna hear the invitation. And and if you're not careful, what can happen? It becomes a ritual, it becomes a routine, it becomes something that, that we just okay, we we've done our duty, you know, we we've done our our, our obedience to the Lord. Now, and, and I'm not talking about what we do here. We're, this church here is freer to let the Lord minister than, than most any churches I've ever seen. Uh, I mean, I've heard that testimony not from, from, from Brother Leon, different ones that's, that's been outside their church. All you got to do is just go outside the church a little bit. I know, don't go, don't leave. <laughs> but before, before we came here, I've told you this before, Chris and I went to a lot of churches, and, and you don't find what we have here everywhere. But what has happened across our nation here? The majority of churches in America over the past decades, they've drifted into this mindset of, of uh, a tradition trumps the Holy Spirit, basically. I mean, uh, Chris and I were in, in, in Boone years ago, and, and we visited. We'd, we, I'd never been in a Lutheran church. And uh, they handed us out a little pamphlet at the start. I mean, a little the brochure, the little bulletin. And, and everything was written down on there, what you're going to do, almost to the T. I mean, there was no room. If, if anybody said hallelujah and started getting happy, that threw the whole schedule off. I mean, everything was thrown off. And, and they, everything went just like clockwork. And, and I thought, where's, where's, what if God wants to move here? Where, where do you pencil in God in, in this, this, this program here? Uh, and, and that's what I'm saying. You know, it's, it's easy for, to, to let tradition just over, overshadow what God's wanting to do. Uh, if we, and we're still, still talking about living for Christ here. If the Holy Spirit wants to open the door for you to explain to someone about Jesus or, or any questions about Scripture, do it. You know, let, when God opens the door, we have to step through it. Uh, if they don't accept it, do we give up Tucker Tales and run away? No. What did Stephen do? Stephen, he stood up. We had to stand and steadfast in what we believe and who we believe in, regardless of how, uh, how hard it might get. Now, now, like I said, keep in mind, we're looking at Stephen's story here from a historical point of view, but it, it could very well be in our future, you know, and, and not too far away here. Uh, after Stephen, he was falsely accused in the courtroom here. The next chapter, it, it's just very interesting whenever I started reading this. Stephen gives the defense, his defense here. In, in chapter 7, verse 1 in Acts here, the, the high priest, he asked Stephen, he said, basically, what have you got saved for yourself about all these charges against you? And that, that was his question. And, and for the sake of time, we won't read all these verses, but if you look at the verses there in chapter 7, from starting verse 1, and, and you'll look and see where he began by, by laying the groundwork, the basics of what the Jews believed. And he started with the call of Abraham and, and the promises of God to Abraham and Isaac and Jacob. Uh, he talked about how God let them dwell in Egypt until it became a, a nation, a multitude. Uh, then he told them about how Moses let them out of bondage, headed toward the promised land. Uh, this is Stephen. He's telling the Jews this. He's, he's laying the groundwork, laying the foundation for them. He, he tells them about building the temple, stones of testimony. That's, that's the Ten Commandments that uh, were written on. He talked to him about the rebellion in the wilderness that led to 40 years of wandering here. Stephen gave a, a complete history, Jewish history here of these, to these people. And, and remember, he, this Bible tells us, the scriptures we just read, he was speaking as the Holy Spirit gave him you know, the things, the wisdom to speak. Remember what Jesus said about uh, standing before the magistrates and rulers? What, what would the Holy Spirit do? You remember what he said in Luke? Here's what he said in Luke chapter 12, verse 11 and 12. Jesus said this, And when they bring you into the synagogues and to the magistrates and powers, take new thought how or what uh, thing you shall answer or what you, you shall say. For the Holy Ghost shall teach you in the same hour what you ought to say. Now, is that important? We, we mentioned that just a little a few minutes ago. How important it is to let... 
if you've never read the scriptures, how can, how can the Lord bring, how can the Holy Spirit bring those to mind? So that's the, you know, that's the point of us. When Paul told Timothy, study to show yourself approved. The workman needs not to be ashamed. Rightly dividing the word. That's, that's the whole crux of that verse, of rightly dividing the word. Uh, like I said, we, we can be lied to, but if we know the scripture, we know what Jesus said, we know what the Bible tells us, we don't have to be subject to any of these things. Go ahead, Mike. No, no. I mean, you're going to run them off and make them mad. Mm -hmm. If you go out with a spirit drawing you to talk to them, you'll give you what Here's the importance of letting the Holy Ghost tell you and, and instruct you, and, and you'll know. Uh, here, let me read this. Look at verse 51, 52 and 53. This is Stephen. Here's, here's what he tells these. He, he said, you stiff-necked and uncircumcised in heart and ears, you do always resist the Holy Ghost as your fathers did. So do you. Which of the prophets have you not your fathers persecuted? And they have, and have slain them which showed before of, of the coming of the just ones. Talking about Jesus there. Of whom you have been now the betrayers and murderers who have received the law by the dispensation of angels and have not kept it. There's a reason, reason I'm going to read this verses here. Now, I, I, what was inside of them. And... and once it's exposed, it doesn't matter who you are. It doesn't matter who you are. You, you have to do something about it. Go ahead. And even John the Baptist, you talk about them, uh, stiff dick people. He called them a generation of Bible. Yeah, yeah, he did. But, but once, once it's exposed, you know, what do you do? You, there's only two things. You, you can either repent or reject it. You can turn away from the truth. That, I mean, that's the, that's the two things that happen here. So, so how does this relate to us today? What happened to Stephen? How does it relate to us? Let's bring it forward. Uh, remember first, what we said in the first lesson, how, that Stephen was full of the Holy Ghost. Uh, again, in 2021, do we need this? Do we need the infilling of the Holy Spirit? Uh, what if we had to stand in front of authorities and explain why we did this this week? You know, what, what do you say? Uh, so many times we, we would be intimidated to the point we probably wouldn't have anything to say. But if the Holy Spirit is directing you, I mean, there could come a time and, and, and we'd be faced with the same circumstances. Uh, pastors, if anybody watched the stuff's happening in Canada, some of us have. Those pastors been been hauled out of churches up there. That one guy, uh, this one guy in particular, he ran the, ran the cops out the first time, but they came back and they carried him out. And uh, so we, we know that that's, that's, what are you going to do when you stand before the magistrates? Our pastor could be faced with that. And if we gather together like this, any of us could be faced with that. What are you going to say when you stand before these? And uh, what, what's your answer going to be? And, and it could be sooner than we think. Now, uh, I, I think we can learn a valuable lesson here from, from the example that, that Stephen's given us here. Here's something that, that's really stuck struck me and I read this a long time ago back when I was working <clears throat> uh, and we really, really need to get this notice how he started his defense Stephen talked about things they could agree on he said here's your history he went around he repeated he recited the history of the Jewish nation they could agree they couldn't refute that he says and they agreed that, that yeah here we are uh, here's and this is a tactic that's used uh, the best secular uh, advisors on communication today, uh, they say start with what you can agree on, lay a foundation before you ever start discussing the things that you don't agree on. Uh, and you've automatically got some, some common ground that you can stand on. And, and uh, that simply proves, and you think back when this was written, you know, Stephen, that's a couple thousand years ago, that simply means that the Holy Spirit knows what he's doing back then and he knows what he's doing now. If we apply what happened to Stephen back then, you know, God hasn't changed. So that, that same principle applies to us today. If we, if we were to have to stand before the magistrates, that, let the Holy Spirit lead us and guide us here. Uh, if you look back at verse 48, it says, How be it the Most High dwells not in temples made with hands, 
essay of the prophet. And he's quoting Isaiah there. But, but what Stephen's saying, what's he getting here? Uh, and, and he's saying emphatically that God can't be housed in a building. We, we call this the church, but it's the church. Pastor tells us all the time, this is the church. You are the church. Uh, this is what God's dwelling in here. Uh, so, so what was the point Peter, uh, 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 Stephen was trying to get here? These are learned men on the council. He's standing before these Pharisees on, on the, the Sanhedrin council here. And they, they didn't understand this new covenant through Jesus Christ. And by the death and resurrection of Jesus. This was what the whole, the whole Testament had been pointing to Jesus all the whole time. And, and they didn't see it. And, and Stephen's trying to get them to understand this. Um, and and uh, the last thing about verse 51 here. He called them stiff. Uh, it's time for us to go about. But notice what he said. He called them stiff neck and, and uncircumcised heart. That simply means that when something wicked comes into the heart, they just ignored it. They let it go on. They, they, they didn't cut it out. They kept going down the same old path here. And, and Stephen's drawing an analogy that, that we ought to be able to understand. Ritualism can't bring anybody to right standing with God here. I, I worked with a guy years ago, and I'm, I think I might have mentioned this before one time. His, his, his great-grandpappy went to this so-and-so church. And his, his great-grandparents went to this so-and-so church. His grandparents, his, his mom and dad went to this church. I'm going to this church and I'm going to heaven because of that. That's basically what he was saying. And we know that, that you know, that's not true. Rituals won't do that, but it's, it's in Christ Jesus here. Now, and, and I know we're out of time, but we, we see Stephen. Why, why did Stephen have to endure what he did? Uh, it, it, the others, some people don't. Some people don't have to endure these hard places. Uh, there's no easy answer for that. You know, God has a timetable for each of our lives. And here's the whole thing. The events in our lives, whatever they are, you know, Peter said, don't think it's strange that these fire trials come. Some people face fiery trials more than others. Some people seem like they're just scooting right along and, and everything's all hunky-dory. Others, man, they just suffer and struggle through. But, that, but then you get, here's the point. They struggle and they get through it. So that's, that's the whole point about serving the Lord and, and letting him lead us here. Um, what does God want for our lives? I, I don't know. That's between you and God. He knows what you, you're supposed to be doing. But uh, we need to follow the, the leading of the Holy Spirit in everything that we do. Uh, and we're, we're a couple minutes over. We'll let you go. Thank you, Roger. Yes. Who's, did we do